Hello, good evening. I'm Roger Johnson. Welcome to Northwest Tonight. Our top story. Dozens of former pupils take legal action against their old school after we uncover decades of historical abuse. People often say, you know, school days are the happiest days of your life. They certainly were not. It was one of the dark experiences in my life. We'll hear from two brothers who experienced similar abuse a decade apart. Also tonight, police say they'll take no further action against a woman who retweeted lies about the Southport stabbing suspect's identity. Cleaning up Windermere. After two years of criticism, United Utilities announces a £150 million plan to tackle sewage pouring into the lake. Evie's honoured after keeping a cool head in the crisis to help save a man's life. And it's been another day of clear blue skies and sunshine with those temperatures above average too. More of that to come over the next couple of days. Join me later in the programme for a full detailed forecast. Back in June, our reporter Katie Walderman revealed historical allegations of physical abuse at a Catholic school in Merseyside. Four former pupils of St Mary's College in Crosby were taking legal action against the Christian Brothers Order who ran the school until 2006. Well, following that report, dozens more pupils have come forward, all with similar allegations of beating and ill treatment. Here's Katie's second exclusive report. Brothers Anthony and Eamon both went to St Mary's College. They may have studied a decade apart, but their experiences were the same. I endured, without any doubt, the most traumatic experiences that I've had in my life as a result particularly of two other Christian brothers. People often say, you know, school days are the happiest days of your life. They certainly were not. It was one of the dark experiences in my life. They got in touch after four other past pupils shared their experiences of their time at the school with North West Tonight when St Mary's was run by the Christian Brothers. I thought, oh my goodness, these people are talking about exactly the kind of experiences that I had. So it mirrored my experience. And so when Anthony rang me and said, hey, you know, this programme's been on television, I thought, my goodness me. Anthony said hearing their accounts gave him the courage to speak out about his time at St Mary's during the 1960s. I certainly think the experience of Brother Brickley was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. He's seared in my memory as the worst human being that I've encountered. Um, he should never, ever have been anywhere near a child. He resorted to hitting children. And this wasn't just a kind of a tap with a ruler. This was a leather strap and he would hold your hands over the edge of a desk and he would whack it, whack your hand, so badly that I would go home with wheels. Anthony suffered a breakdown after leaving school, but made it his mission to ensure no other child should suffer like he had when he became a head teacher at a large Catholic comprehensive school. It was clear when I became a head teacher that I never wanted a child to experience anything like what I went through. And I think that has probably been the single biggest drive in my approach to school leadership. Eamon attended St Mary's College in the 1950s. He says he too was regularly strapped, but one beating in particular stood out when he said he was repeatedly hit around the head with a metal bar by one of his teachers, Brother Ryan. He had a, a, a metal bar about yay long, and he just hit me on the back of the head with it. Wrong. Do it again. Wrong. You know, and oh my God, it was terrible. I knew my head was bleeding. But um, when I went home that evening, my mother said to me, have you been fighting? And I said, no, why? She said, well, there's, there's blood on your shirt. Anthony and Eamon weren't the only ones to get in touch with me. In fact, more than 50 people have since come forward since my initial report, all with similar allegations of violence and abuse, 40 of whom are looking to join the legal action against the Congregation of Christian Brothers. Were you surprised by the response? 
It's a remarkable response that we've had since the last report. We've now taken accounts from over 40 former pupils and had messages from a number of more. Uh, and what we're seeing is accounts of abuse from the 1960s through to the 1990s. And it's painting quite a harrowing picture. We've got more accounts of the physical abuse that's been taking place, but also we're starting to hear some instances of alleged sexual abuse. Corporal punishment was legal in private schools up until 1998, but the legal action claimed claims the violence meted out was excessive and unjustified. In a statement, the Congregation of Christian Brothers says it's unable to comment in view of the prospective legal action, but says it sincerely regrets any and all forms of abuse that may have been committed on anyone who attended St Mary's or the Mount. While a spokesperson for St Mary's College says since the school was transferred from the Christian Brothers to a new charitable trust in 2006, the culture of the college has changed beyond all recognition. What do you hope to achieve by sharing your experiences? I just want to get it off my chest. It's a bad period in my life. It shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have happened. I think a lot about what happened to me at St Mary's. The order said, Dear Anthony, we recognise the hurt you went through. This was absolutely unacceptable. We are genuinely sorry. That would do me. That report from Katie Walderman. Now, a woman from Cheshire who was arrested after sharing an online post containing a fake name for the Southport stabbing suspect has been told that the police will take no further action. Businesswoman Bernadette Spofforth was arrested in August after reposting the claim that the alleged offender was Muslim. She's now criticising police over her arrest, as Andy Gill reports. Riots flared in Southport and in other towns after three girls were killed in the July 29th attack. The fake name for the alleged Southport attacker and the false claim that he's a Muslim who arrived in Britain by boat last year appeared to inflame anti-immigrant hostility. The rumours were spread online by a number of far-right commentators. Bernadette Spother from Cheshire reposted the fake name with a comment that if it were true, there would be hell to pay. She later deleted the post and apologised after realising the information was wrong. A number of media outlets allege that Ms Spofforth was one of the first people to spread this false information. She was arrested at her home near Chester in August on suspicion of publishing written material to stir up racial hatred and false communications. Now in a post on X, formerly Twitter, she says the police have told her there'll be no further action against her. My supposed crime, according to many journalists and social media activists, was a post on X that they incorrectly claimed I had made up and which they decided was the cause of the riots in Southport and all across the country. The false information appeared to originate from a Pakistan-based news website called Channel 3 Now and its editor-in-chief later apologised. Ms Spofforth says she's lived through a nightmare, though she says that's nothing in comparison to the suffering of the Southport victims. But she says a vocal part of society wants opinions like hers oppressed. They say they support free speech, but they mean only the speech they agree with. They say they support dialogue, but only the dialogue that agrees with their worldview. Cheshire Police did not name Bernadette Spofforth, but in a statement said, a woman who was arrested in relation to an inaccurate social media post has been released without charge. Following a thorough investigation, a decision has been made that no further action will be taken due to insufficient evidence. In August, Julie Sweeney, also from Cheshire, was jailed for 15 months after calling on Facebook for a mosque to be blown up with the adults inside. Andy Gill, BBC Northwest Tonight. An inquest into the death of a father and son who fell 14 storeys from a Liverpool building has been told that the platform they were standing on was faulty. 53-year-old David Bottomley and his 17-year-old son Clayton were working at the Unity building in 2021. The inquest revealed that the motors which operated the pla pla pa excuse me, platform's brakes didn't work properly because part of the mechanism had cracked. The Actors' Union says it is determined to protect freedom of expression after Manchester's Royal Exchange Theatre cancelled a modern version of a Shakespeare play containing references to Gaza and transgender rights. 
Equity met theatre managers today after it scrapped a Midsummer Night's Dream. The theatre says there are other issues also involved in its decision, including injuries and delays to technical preparations. Everton fans and former players attended a memorial service for the club's former striker Kevin Campbell, who died in June after a short illness at the age of 54. The service this afternoon was held at St Luke's Church, next door to Goodison Park. The mother of twin babies attacked by Lucy Letby told an inquiry into her crimes that the nurse might have been stopped, stopped earlier if staff had shown more curiosity. Child E died after having air injected into his bloodstream. Less than 24 hours later, child F was poisoned with insulin but recovered. Our health correspondent Jill Dummigan listened to today's evidence. She's uh, in the newsroom. So, Jill, as I said, these two uh, children were twins. Yes, babies E and F were born in August 2015. They were being cared for on the neonatal unit while their mum was away from them on the ward. Now, she described going to see a child E and hearing screaming. Letby was there. Child E had blood around his mouth, but Letby told her it was just a tube rubbing the back of his throat and told her to go back up. A few hours later, though, her baby died. 24 hours later, child F suffered a huge collapse in blood sugar level. His mum said they were told he had an infection. He'd actually been poisoned with synthetic insulin. He recovered but was left with learning difficulties. Now, their mother questioned why staff hadn't investigated why child E had bled so badly and why child F's insulin levels had been so high. She said this could have been an end to this whole horrendously sad turn of events, but it wasn't. Jill, an external review into all the deaths was carried out more than a year later, wasn't it? Yes, and the mother of babies E and F said she knew nothing about this until a taxi drew up outside their house with a letter from the Trust telling her about it 30 minutes before it was published on their website. She said it beggared belief. That and subsequent letters from the Trust offered a meeting with the medical director Ian Harvey, but she said every time she rang up he wasn't there and he never rang her back. She also talked about the lack of bereavement support from the Trust, which amounted, she said, to a leaflet that was given to her while she was still holding her dead son in her arms. But Jill, she wasn't the only parent to mention the lack of support today, was she? No, we also heard from the parents of child G. Now, she'd been born very, very premature, but she was doing well. They were told that she'd be able to go home soon. But in September 2015, she collapsed twice. She survived but was left profoundly disabled. Her dad broke down in the inquiries. He described how she needs 24-hour care. She can't talk, sit up by herself. She can't swallow. She's blind. She has very little understanding of what's going on. He said they weren't offered any support, given any opportunity to find out what had happened to her, and they weren't aware of any of the reports being carried out. The inquiry continues tomorrow. OK, Jill, thank you very much. Jill Dummigan there. Now, over the past couple of years, we've reported the issues with sewage discharges into Windermere. Campaigners have said that it's becoming an open water sewer as uh, wastewater discharges have increased. Well, today, the water company, United Utilities, announced a £150 million plan to tackle the problem. However, campaigners fear it won't be enough, as our environment correspondent, Judy Hobson, explains. It's England's largest and most iconic lake, but Windermere has also been at the forefront of a national campaign to end sewage pollution. Wastewater treatment works like this in Ambleside are under pressure due to an increasing number of tourists in the region and extreme weather events. So, yeah, so this is one of the storm stories, thanks. So in heavy rain, Today, the water company United Utilities said it proposes to increase spending on infrastructure in Windermere from £41 million to £200 million. It's going to upgrade nine of our wastewater treatment works to an exceptionally high standard of discharge. And the other part is it's going to improve six storm overflows. It's going to reduce their operation to, to an average of less than 10 times a year. There has been a high-profile campaign involving some celebrities to demand an end to sewage pollution in Windermere. Today, United Utilities said it was responding to customers and regulators. Uh, we've worked really closely with the people such as the regulators to say, what does this lake quality need to be based on standards that they expect, based on legislation? And that's what formed the basis of this proposed investment. 
While the Save Windermere campaign welcomed the investment, it said it wasn't nearly enough to end the problem of sewage pollution in the lake. It's very clear that this has come about from three years of campaigning for us, in which we've raised the awareness of the exploitation of the lake and also the fact that there's been inadequate investment for decades to ensure the long-term protection of the area. What they have done is they've put the bare minimum on the table and it's now for us, the general public, to stand up and say, we want an end to sewage pollution in Windermere once and for all. Sewage enters our rivers and lakes after heavy rain, as the sewage system can't cope. It's a problem across the country. So if you're putting 150 million into Windermere, does that mean other areas will remain polluted for longer? We've submitted a business plan that's around £14 billion of investment across the next five years. Of that, around 3 to £4 billion is to improve storm overflows. So it certainly doesn't mean other areas won't get the investment it needs. Work on improving storm overflows here has already begun. Meanwhile, the Save Windermere campaign says it will continue to demand an end to any sewage spilling into the lake. Judy Hobson, BBC Northwest Tonight, Windermere. Now, have a look at this. It's the iconic Crescent Hotel in Buxton, and it's up for sale. Reopened in 2020 after major work, you might remember we reported on it, it took 17 years, cost £70 million, and £11 million of that was a loan from Derbyshire County Council. However, earlier this year, it emerged that the company behind the project is struggling financially. It's failed to make loan repayments to the council. Matthew Barlow's got more. It was a major facelift designed to kickstart Buxton's economy. But less than four years after opening, the five-star hotel at the Crescent is up for sale. I just think for the tourist town and the heritage yeah. that the the town has got. I think it's such a shame. I'm, I'm surprised very much that it is for sale. Um, I would have thought, you know, in a, a town like Buxton, they could make a go of it. If you're going to spend that much, you could get a really nicely done up house. I know, I know in Worksworth, um, there are a lot of really like beautiful Airbnbs. When the luxury spa hotel opened, local shop owners noticed a boost in trade, like Isla Dawes, who has a fine art gift store close by. It brings in um, a moneyed crowd. Um, lots of people go and get, wed get married there. I've got prints and things of the Crescent, so people like to buy nice mementos. There was a mood of celebration back in 2020 when this five-star hotel opened its doors for the first time after 17 years' work, which cost £70 million. But there were warning signs earlier this year when the company behind the project defaulted on an £11.4 million loan from the County Council. The current operators of the hotel, Enzana, point out it's business as usual and it'd be sold debt free. And the tourist board doesn't think it's all doom and gloom either. It's a great business, great property, um, and I'm sure some savvy operator out there will, will snap it up and take it to the next level and it'll continue to be a success. So the Crescent might have been built in the 1780s, but a big part of Buxton's future hinges on this building. Matthew Barlow, BBC North West Tonight, Buxton. Right, let's crack straight on with sport. The Champions League is back. The bookies' favourites are at home tonight, live to the Etihad Stadium. Yunus Muller, you're there with Manchester City fans ahead of the game. Roger, it's a bright and sunny evening, perfect conditions really for a game of football. The merchandise is doing quite well and the food van, I'm told, for one night only is serving up Italian salami and mozzarella cheese and for cash here and the PA system is belting out Oasis, what more could fans ask for? But it's not the music, of course, but the football they want to see in this new Champions League format, more games, more teams and if last night is anything to go by, plenty of goals. But Pep Guardiola wouldn't be drawn on the new format. It's like in the Premier League, it's not necessary to take the table right now. It will be in the future. Is win the first game and the next ones, and after we see. But for all of us, it's new. So, and maybe for more experience next seasons, if we are lucky to play this competition, so maybe we can read better what we have to do. Well, City have had a, a, a good start to the Premier League, four straight wins. This week, of course, we've had a lot of coverage about those alleged breaches of Premier League financial rules. Rules for tonight. 
fans, of course, will want to concentrate on football. And you can catch the highlights on Match of the Day after the late bulletin. Thank you very much, Yunus Muller, there live at the Etihad Stadium. Quick bit of cricket for you. The penultimate game in Lancashire's fight for survival in Division 1 of the County Championship. Luke Wells was 78, not out at the close of day two. Lanks building a second in his lead of 292 runs with three wickets remaining. Now, the BBC Local Radio Make a Difference Awards, as we've been telling you in recent weeks, honour people who do exceptional things in their communities, but few people of any age make as much of a contribution as Evie from Fleetwood. She's only 10, but she's been nominated for recognition by BBC Radio Lancashire for keeping a cool head in a real crisis. And Molly Brewer can tell you more about what she did. This is a walk 10-year-old Evie from Fleetwood does most days. But on one of those days, it took a dramatic turn. Me and my friend was walking to the shop on our own. Then we seen this unconscious man just lad down. My, my friend didn't know what to do. I ran to the fire station to see what they could do. And luckily, someone was there. And you were just walking to the shop. It's not what you expect to see. Mm. How did you feel when you saw that man? Very scared and nervous. After running to get help at the fire station, an ambulance was called, and Evie's heroic actions left her parents and the community stunned. She's always done us proud, but on this incident, she just knew what to do straight away, and it saved the man's life, essentially. Just to get recognised that she has done a little bit of good in the community. What has the community had to say about it? Because I know it's a close-knit community. Very much, and she's like a little local celebrity. And Evie's been recognised for her actions. She's received an award from Lancashire Police. Evie absolutely played a pivotal part in saving somebody's life. So we were incredibly impressed at her bravery. And that's not the only award Evie could be getting. She's been nominated for a BBC Radio Lancashire Make a Difference Award. Shocking and very exciting and I'm really happy. Molly Brewer, BBC Northwest Tonight, Fleetwood. Yeah, well done uh, to Evie and all the other nominees. Right, let's have a look at the weather. Here's Abby. How's it looking? Yes, it's looking nice again over the next couple of days. It's almost impossible to choose our weather watcher photos at the moment. There's so many glorious ones. Chester looking beautiful in the sunshine today and a gorgeous sunrise at Clayton Lee Woods as well. Thank you so much for sending all those weather photos. And if you would like to keep them coming, you can send those weather photos into us. You can send them into me directly on social media or you can become one of our BBC weather watchers. Even better, they get sent straight into us at the Weather Centre. So the forecast for tomorrow then, another dry and fine day. It should feel warm. Temperatures above average for the time of year. We are still in this mild air mass and we're still under the influence of high pressure. It's sat to the north of us, sat over Scandinavia as we speak and it does look as though it's hanging on right through the weekend. Starting to pull away though into the early part of next week where things are going to cool down a little bit and just generally turn more mixed and more changeable. Overnight tonight, it is set to be a dry night. There will be some low cloud mist and fog rolling in from the east. Easterly winds pushing those in. A little bit of moisture around as we start the day tomorrow and our temperatures dropping back to 7 or 8 degrees. So quite a fresh start to the day tomorrow. Any early morning mist, fog and low cloud might be a little slow to clear in one or two eastern parts, but elsewhere, dry and bright, plenty of sunshine developing and warm once again. Those temperatures could get as high as 22 degrees Celsius for tomorrow. That's 72 Fahrenheit. The average for this time of year is about 16 degrees, so those temperatures are a good few degrees above average. And our weather is set to stay mostly dry and settled through Friday and through most of Saturday as well. I think just a little bit more cloud building in over the weekend, but temperatures staying above average, 21 or 22 degrees. We are at risk of seeing perhaps a little more cloud on Sunday and one or two showers just clipping the far south of the region. But things are set to turn a little bit cooler and more changeable into next week. Those temperatures will gradually drop closer to the seasonal average and we will start to see a little bit more mixed conditions, Rog. Thank you, Abby, as always. Uh, just really quickly before we go, as you know, we've been behind the scenes at Manchester Airport over the course of the summer. There's a, a, an extended report on our time behind the scenes on the BBC iPlayer right now, if you want to.